All right, Harvard Medical School professor George Church, Nebula Genomics, Oasis Labs, Grammy-nominated artist Akon and Acoin NFT are coming together to launch the world's first genomic NFT. Joining us now is Anne Favre-Willis, COO of Oasis Labs, and Kamal Obad, CEO and co-founder of Nebula Genomics. Welcome, Anne and Kamal. Yeah, thanks. Really happy to be here. Great to have you. All right, so genomic NFT, you're turning your DNA into an NFT. Why in the world would anyone want to do this? <laughs> yeah, so we, we, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So we've had this conversation about how we can enable our users to fairly and transparently share their data with researchers for, for years now. So when we started Nebula, we had the vision of building a trustless and decentralized data sharing network for health and genomic data. Um, and this really comes from Dr. George Church's vision uh, from years ago when he started the Personal Genome Project, which is effectively an open source database where people can contribute health data and share it with researchers. Um, so we found that NFTs can be a really compelling and potentially interesting use case for monetizing and, and sharing uh, ge genomic data as a digital asset, which has become very valuable uh, over the past five, 10 years, it's become more mainstream for researchers to use. Right, how, how will this information be used? I, and things get hacked all the time. Is this to pose a danger to people with very private information in these DNA NFTs? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is give people complete control over their data. So if they choose to share it, they can do so in a way that's transparent and they can audit who has access to it and they can potentially make some money off of it as well. Um, so what happens today, and most people don't realize that, is when you buy a genetic test from a personal genomics company, it's frequently already being monetized and shared with researchers. Um, so about 40 million people in the U.S. have done some sort of consumer genetic test. Uh, we want to shift the model from where it's not transparent and it's not, uh, um, it's not privacy preserving to, to share data with researchers to a way that the patient comes first. So they can engage directly with researchers. They can choose to share their genomic data in a way that uh, they're fairly compensated and in a way that's transparent. And even more importantly, they can choose to share additional data with researchers, which is what really our mission is, is building a higher engagement, uh, higher efficacy way for patients to contribute data to, to research and help power medical breakthroughs. Um, so it's not immediately obvious. What is the role of Acon in this project or Acoin in this project? Yeah, so we've known some of the people who work at Acoin for, for a while now, and they're launching an NFT project. Um, so they're doing a, a bunch of high profile NFT launches uh, throughout the summer. Um, so they're very interested in what we're doing with, with George. Um, so we're starting this partnership with them uh, to essentially build awareness. And, and Acon and the Acoin team have a, have a broad platform. So we're excited to partner with them on this specific launch. Um, since today we're really just doing Dr. George Church's genome, uh, but this is possibly something we'll roll out to all of the users at Nebula, um, tens of thousands of people who've, who've bought genetic testing through us. So, uh, echoing a little bit of what Christina was asking here, you know, there's a fear that genetic data can ultimately dictate things such as insurance coverage. Um, and, and what kind of, uh, you know, what, what happens to a patient in, in a hospital and, and what they can do. Uh, and why should data be allowed to float around the blockchain where it could be traded? Yeah, yeah so... Oh, go ahead, Anne. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's an interesting question. I think, um, honestly, that's one of the reasons that we've worked with Nebula and um, with Acoin on this as well is, we think that by making it an NFT, um, you're really what you're really doing is tokenizing that data and giving the individual user who owns it control of that data. And so instead of it being sort of shepherded or sold as it is on any Web2 uh, market now, we're actually giving users back control of their data. Now, the nice reason and, and one of the reasons that Oasis Labs is involved in this as well is we are a privacy first uh blockchain uh, uh, application layer, and we're, we build on the Oasis network, which is a privacy-first network. And so what that means is folks can hold their NFT of their genomic data and then store it in a private and confidential way. So information really isn't flowing um, openly and freely, um, but really is uh, we're putting the power back in the hands of so, the individual as opposed to these large institutions. 
wouldn't the easiest way just to be that no one no one creates an NFT to begin with or submit their genetic data or 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 does so judiciously, such as with their doctors directly and not, let's say, uh, one of these companies. Yeah, yeah I mean, so I think, I think the, Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I was just, I was just gonna, gonna add, so there is utility to getting GISING today. Uh, there's a lot of benefits that patients can receive by doing whole genome sequencing or genotyping or doing like a standard 23andMe test. The issue is the way that data is being shared today isn't very transparent. But here at Nebula and Oasis, we don't want to disincentivize data sharing. So it's important to share that data with researchers. Um, that's what's powering the personal genomics revolution. That's what's powering personalized medicine. That's what's powering uh, therapeutic development. Uh, but we think there needs to be a more transparent way to share that data and the incentives need to be aligned. So we're not, we're not trying to pitch to uh, patients and customers of these consumer genetic testing businesses that they shouldn't be sharing their data. We think they should be. Uh, but they should be doing it in a way that's more secure, more privacy preserving and enables them, which hasn't been the case today. Um, and just to follow up on this privacy issue. So privacy is obviously one concern, right? But I mean, the other part is just actually convincing people that it is private, which is another matter. But there's also this issue of, you know, one of the big selling points of blockchain is immutability, right? Like once something's on a blockchain, it can't be changed, it can't be altered, it can't be removed. And for me, that raises a lot of tricky questions when it comes to medical data, because sometimes, you know, or medical or genetic data rather, because sometimes things you know, information is wrong, right? Like there are mistakes made. And then what happens in that case, right? If something is an error or, and then it's, it's just there forever. I mean, is there any way to like reverse that? Because the whole idea of blockchain technology is that you can't. Yeah, I think it's a question of what you're storing to the ledger. Um, and so in the instance of the way our, our network works and the way we work with Nebula, the, the information itself is held in a um, confidential way uh, basically at a compute layer of the network. And then what's being sent to uh, the immutable ledger, the consensus layer of the network, um, is some record that that data exists and is being held. So the data itself is not being shared. It's actually the, the record that it exists. So for example, what you'd be able to track with an immutable ledger is who had access to it, who you, who you gave access to. And then if you wanted to pull back control of your genome, that would be tracked as well on the ledger. And so in that way, what we're really doing is tracking at this uh, at, at the public layer where the where the information is being sent and shared, not the information itself. And that means that you can add uh, more data, more information um, in a confidential way without actually uh, running into the issues that you're talking about. Um, Maybe you could walk us through some specific use cases of you know how this would work. Yeah, so one uh, particular use case is, for instance, if you are, you are a rare disease patient um, and you want to contribute your data to rare disease researchers. So historically, one of the big challenges for rare diseases is that it's very difficult to recruit patients and collect data to actually do therapeutic development to the point where it's, it's too expensive to make cures for these diseases. Uh, so you can envision a use case where a rare disease community comes together and licenses uh, and gives access to their genomic data to relevant researchers in return for compensation or, or, or whatever they might want. Um, so that's one very specific use case uh, for how someone can contribute their data to research. And we're seeing a big movement of patient empowerment uh, where, that, where patients are organizing together and building biobanks and data banks and trying to get researchers organized around developing cures for their diseases. Um. Is, is the problem, and it's a problem in the United States that there is no, for instance, uh, method by which uh, medical data, for instance, is centralized, where uh, people can see, for instance, uh, in countries like Israel, where there was a, uh, it, they basically ran an entire trial on COVID, on, on COVID vaccines and could map out the comorbidity, morbidities in that country because they had they had basically centralized or you know very few databases out there which gathered the entire population's uh, medical history and were able to see how they reacted to the the vaccines um, mm -hmm. is that does that that kind of a method which other countries have doesn't exist in the US are are you filling a vacuum that in the US and what are the threats that if the US ever gets around to doing something like that, where, you know, in, in the case of that, whereas private HMOs had that data, um, where the US 
eventually goes to that system, what then is the benefit of something like this? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, I'd say there would be significant benefit in having data in general be more accessible to researchers um, at scale, right? And so I think the example that you raise uh, in Israel is, is a great example of that. Now, there's a ton of risks that go along with that, including at a core level, do you trust your government to hold that data uh, in a way that you think is safe? And so one of the things that is so compelling and beneficial about blockchain networks and combining that with privacy technology is it allows us to create uh, large databases where individuals are um, feeding information into the system, but retaining control of it. Um, and at the same time, protecting that information. So setting access and controls around, for example, I'd like researchers to access my health data, but not a pharmaceutical company or not the government. And so setting some um, control and restrictions around that can be very beneficial. I think so in that way, it's not as simple as having the government have a database or not. There's clearly a significant number of, of uh, concerns and and privacy issues that would go along with that that we're seeing uh, really be debated now even in things as simple as uh, vaccine passports and whether there's a registry there. So, you know, we do believe that blockchain technology coupled with privacy technology can really unlock something new. And that's really the thesis of what uh, Oasis has been working on for the last few years.